Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in wonderful Canterbury, New Hampshire. Tonight I'm going to have a little throwback to a classic woodworking joint, probably the signature woodworking joint of the craftsman period, uh, the arts and crafts movement as furniture went, and that is the through tenon. I just want to show you tonight the basic fundamentals of cutting a through tenon, and I'm going to show you using a hollow chisel mortiser, and then if you don't have a hollow chisel mortiser, I'm going to show you a second way, using a drill press. And if you don't have a drill press, I'm going to show you, no I'm not, I'm not going to show you another way, I'm not hand chopping one tonight, but I'll just, you'll, you'll see enough with the drill press, you'll get a sense of the hand chopping, but if you don't have a hollow chisel mortiser, I think after the first piece you build, you'll be itching to have one, especially if it's a piece like this. This is actually the end section to our coffee table project, which was all made of white oak. This isn't glued up yet, but look at that smorgasbord of mortises. They're everywhere, and this is just one end. I really enjoyed this project. We had like a long mortise in the inside, and then it, it stepped in, and it came through and it sat proud just like this mortise here and then these two these came all the way through as well and that was pretty slick because we stepped it down so that we could have the full mortise coming out the ends so you'll have these double mortises so mortises are protruding they're proud they're through mortises all over the place with this excuse me, with this project. So if you want to build uh, and enjoy the wonderful world of through mortises in mm -hmm. Craftsman's Furniture, this is a great project, the Craftsman Coffee Table. The only other one I could think of that had through mortises was the rocking chair, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the rocking chair project has them coming out as well. We're going to move right into the demo. Martin just reminded us that the shop stool also had Oh, tenons. yes. Thank, thank you, you Martin. Martin. Yes, that's right. Stop the shop stool project. That's right. That was a lot of fun. That shop yeah. stool, that's probably the least um, effort of those three projects. So if you wanted to just get a taste of them. However, those are angled through tenons and a lot of fun. All right, so here we are. We've got our piece of stock. I'm going to put, this is the face and this is all, I put one and two because what I'm going to do is join this rail in this way. And we want to have a through tenon come all the way through right here. I'm going to step it down about an inch and a half on each one. And then we'll do our second one. We'll cut by hand and that will go through here. Well, not technically by hand, but the, the combination drill press and chisel method. So we're just going to mark those out. And I'm going to have it step in about a half just before the halfway mark. So we're going to have a, a mortise here and one right about here. You know, I'm just generally, so that means if I put my, my famous stop right there, my finger, I'm going to come over on this side and it'll be somewhere in this area. Let's see where this one is. Somewhere like right here. Okay, so that's where we want our mortises, and that's typical of laying out a project. You just roughly scribble where you want to make your dimensional indications for cutting them, whether you're doing them by hand, drill press, or with a hollow chisel mortiser. Now I should say, there are other souped up ways of cutting mortises and through mortises, and those typically involve a router or some type of advanced machine, like a plunge router can be set up with jigs and fences and plunge and you can cut a nice mortise. The only thing about that is you're not going to get a square ended unless you square it off at the end. I'm just going to use these two squares and I'm going to knife these because I want to get a pretty crisp top and bottom. So I'm going to take my marking knife and I've already set this to an inch and a half down. I'm just going to make a little knife cut here. I don't need to go all the way across because I don't want to scar all the way where the mortise is. In. I know the mortise is just that side of center, so I can hit that. 
I'll do the same at the bottom here. Just got a knife right around there. And then I've got this one set for, actually let's flip it over and get, the, get all of these. And the other end. So this is handy. This is a nice joint to work with. It's so, it just reeks integrity, you know? Except when you cheat and they're not real. No, it really does. Whoops. It's, it's very similar to, in my mind, dove, the dovetail joint, you know, because you see it, it speaks of craftsmanship and care and going the extra mile, making something to really last. You know, it's right there in your face. It just says, this is an honest piece of furniture. So I don't even know why I had to bring up faking it, but maybe that's to accentuate the honesty of what I'm about to do. This is gonna really be the real article. So let's get right here. And one more. <laughs> what? Am I getting some wise There's some comments? comments about the camera lady avatar. Oh. <laughs> and, and if that means that you're Tim Conway. Oh, gosh. Because it looks a lot like Carol Burnett. Yeah, it is. It's kind of a heavy Carol, though. <laughs> well, in one of her characters. Oh, yeah, Carol I guess she did, that. yeah. Yeah, she did kind of ham it up. Those were so funny. All right, so there we go. We've got it all knifed out. And um, we are going to now make our joint. So the mm -hmm. top one, I'm going to make using the mortiser. And I thought we'd do that one first. Then we're going to cut the tenon to fit. And while we're cutting this tenon to go on that through the first one, the mortiser mortise. At the same time, I'm going to cut the tenon for the second one because we're going to cut the tenon and then we're going to cut the mortise to fit. We're all set marking. Let's head on over to the mortiser. I've already got the fence set to, I don't know, um, almost a half an inch. Yeah, 7 sixteenths. It really doesn't matter here. This is just for demonstration. So I'm going to set, let's get the one I wanted to do, the top one. So I'm going to set that with the face against the fence. Let's make sure there's no... You don't want any chips on your table. You don't want to be a slob and make a problem for yourself. So we're going to just cinch that right to the fence really nice and now this is a floor model hollow chisel mortiser you're not if you have one of these it's awesome they do make bench top models that are just a few hundred dollars and that may sound like a lot but i'm telling you if you're going to do that kind of traditional joinery if you're into craftsman furniture or even just i mean a lot of 18th century furniture all the joinery is mortise and tenon for chairs and tables and various pieces like that so it's well worth it to have it you can um, but you can decide for yourself if you don't already have one um, and it's it's a little more it's it's a lot faster to set up than a plunge router and a plunge router holding that and making your own fences and everything that can work but you can make a mess in a heartbeat you know you really can so anyway they all work though. All right, so here we go. I've got it set. I've got my bit on there. And I set the stop to just less than a half an inch. Uh, this piece is a little over an inch and a half. So we're going to go a little over halfway this way. And then we, we're going to flip, come back the other way, and we'll hit it. Now I'm going to sight this square hollow chisel right to that knife line. That's, you can do it. You just sight it as it's coming down. You'll see how it just hits the knife line, and we'll, we should get a good fit. Here we go. Just gonna walk right across. Um, 
Thomas asked what causes the squealing noise that comes from my mort mortiser not idling but when cutting. Oh, uh, it's probably you're getting binding chips in there. Uh, they get, sometimes it's the, it's the pitch or the sap like in the wood that, like cherry does that quite often. It has a pitch in it. Um, or sometimes it's, there's a roughness on the inside of your hollow chisel. So the chips go up and they kind of get bound in there. But I think it's more the case, it's uh, the pitchiness. You also want to make sure that it's set correctly so that bit, I, I should have explained for those of you who have never seen a hollow chisel mortiser, it basically functions like a drill press. So you have a drill bit right there, but it's, it's encased in a hollow square chisel. So you have this thing where the drill bit is making the cut and let's show you, I'm going to show you a quarter inch one here. So there's the drill bit. And notice how deep the gullets are and how widely spaced they are. So it's made that this is just drilling a hole and the chips are fed up and then spilled out the hole in the hollow chisel. Now, the mechanics of it is that that bit has to lead the cut. So it's, you want it to be drilling the hole and then the square chisel follows after and it shears the whole square. So it's just shearing those outer corners and that's how easily it works. And so you want that little flat of the cutter to be about a sixteenth ahead of the pins. You don't just jam it in. You don't want to just jam it all the way up because then it's not leading the cut and you're, not, you're more likely to get bound chips in there. So that might be part of the problem too. You might be hearing it squealing. It may not be set far enough out, but you do want it to lead the cut and it gives you a little more of a gap there for the chips to be fed out and spit up. Spit out, spilled, size? spilled out. Size on the, uh, <laughs> uh, right now I've got a 5 sixteenths on here. So you could do this with any, <laughs> but I'm using that because I have a 5 sixteenths mortising chisel I'm gonna um, use to help clean out after. <sighs> All right, so there I'm halfway. Now I wanna just make sure I keep the face against the fence. And if I marked everything accurately, We'll just come in like this. Now, I should just say, when you're marking this, I marked off the end, which sometimes you can do. And it's really convenient to do that because you can be pretty sure you're good. Um, and if you're knifing, you don't want to knife right around the thing. But if you are squaring around, you do have to bring your square line around. There are times when you're, you're going to mark out that way. But in the interest of time, I didn't want to do that tonight. So here we go. So we'll mash that in and we're ready to go. Second cut. I can feel do it you, break through. Do you have an opinion on mortar stir attachment for a drill press? Uh, they work. That's how my first one was. I. I bought a, uh, a cheap import, you know, uh, drill press that had the, the mortising attachment, and it was it was fine. It worked. I worked with it for a few years, but I'll tell you, um, any tool that's built to do multiple things is usually it usually suffers being great at any one of them because it's made to do too, too many things. But when you have that, you have this hollow chisel mortiser is attached to the, um, the spindle, I'm forgetting the proper word, uh, but well, the chuck of the drill press. And so, and then it goes down. What it is is you end up with this long apparatus like away from the, from the actual mass of the machine. So there's... There's a lot of room for error when, you're, when you have that type of setup. It's just a long way to go by the time you attach it. Whereas a hollow chisel mortiser, look at this. This has these big dovetailed ways back here. Some are on a post, but this is so rigid. It comes right out here, super rigid, and then you're right at your bit. 
There's no long distance there where you lose kind of control. This thing is rock solid. And when you use the, the arm, it's a, basically a lever that's coming down and I'm just gently feeding. So this gives you so, so much more positive uh, feedback and accuracy in the cut. It's just a cleaner job. However, trust me, you can do it. I was doing it. I was building furniture. I was selling furniture. I was making it. This is in the early 90s with one of those attachments. So it was a wood tech, if you remember that, that brand. I got it from uh, Woodworkers Supply down in North Carolina. A wood tech drill press. I don't know if they're still around. They're green. Um, I got rid of it not too long ago. Uh, but it was a great drill press. It lasted for a long time. I just, once I got a mortiser, I just got rid of that hollow chisel. Now check that out. I just knocked the chips out and look how quickly we've got a beautiful mortise right on through. All right, so let's head over to the table saw. We're gonna cut the tenons for this. I'm going to cut a tenon and I want it to fit and I also want it to get all the way through. So let's just do a quick measurement here. Our material is an inch and nine sixteenths, and we want it to protrude a good eighth of an inch, say. You could go heavier and then trim it to whatever you want, but we'll shoot for an eighth of an inch. So we want to have our tenon be one and eleven sixteenths long. So I'm going to just set this to about one and five eighths, and then we'll cut the on the crosscut, we'll get the 11 16 length. Now, some of you may not have seen this before, but this is a tenoning jig homemade, wicked expensive, that you can make yourself. Look at that. Classic. Just a nice block. And save yourself a lot of money buying one of those big metal ones that are kind of a hassle to use. This fits right over your fence, assuming you have a square rail fence like this. And I use it in combination with a spacer jig, which is sized for the tenon. So what I'll do is with the spacer in place, I'm gonna run one cut, then I remove the spacer, and what do you know, it slides over 5 sixteenths, plus the kerf of the saw blade, because we wanna cut on the other side. So this spacer is right about 7 sixteenths. Now when you set this kind of thing up, you gotta drill a mortise first to see what size mortise you're trying to fit, and then you cut the tenon to fit the mortise. And so when you're doing that, you're going to get this stick about 7 16 but it might be a little tight, might be a little loose, thus the tape to fine tune this beautiful jig accessory to work beautifully for you and get it a nice tenon. So I already set that up. It is cutting a nice tenon to fit that mortise. So we're ready to go. All I have to do is remember to keep the face to the fence and run it through. And I'm going to do both of them because we're going to, for the bottom one that we're going to uh, use the drill press with, we're going to cut the mortise to fit the tenon where when you're using a hollow chisel mortiser, it's the opposite way around. Get all your mortises cut, then you cut the tenons to fit the mortises. Here we go. Now I'm ready to cut these cheeks off. So I'm going to drop the saw blade and move the fence so that I am going to get one and 11 sixteenths. That's how long we want it. I could look over here and it should be at one and nine sixteenths, which it is, but I just want you to see a little more directly there. And now I'm gonna just cross cut these the tenon's not perfectly centered, so we'll do the thin one first, and um, then we'll be good to go. So I'm going to just nip those off on the bandsaw quickly so that we don't have anything bind here. I could cut them here, but it'll be just faster this way. So 
Just talk amongst yourselves for a second. Okay. So just lop those off. Now we don't have to think about anything getting trapped. And now I also can use that tenon to set the height. I'll just roll it down until, see if I raise the blade up, see how I'm floating? Now I'm gonna drop the blade. I'm just touching and I'll drop it a touch more. And I'll just raise it slightly until it scores the tenon while I'm going. Then I'm, I'll, so I'll do the fronts first. Then I will flip and I'm gonna have to raise the blade until I just score the other side of the tenon. I'll make all those cuts. Now I'm just, I have this as a backer and I want it to be square to the fence, which it is. It's not the finest uh, cross cut, <laughs> but it, what I'm mainly doing is making sure that tenon is dead flat against the fence when I make my pass on both sides. If I do that, what could go wrong? If I do that, then I'm ensured that both shoulders are true across from each other, which is really important when you have a through tenon because you want that to go right up and have that shoulder really tight, both sides, and that tenon protruding in all its proud glory. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna make the cuts. All right, I'm not sure when we lost you, just briefly, but we were at the table saw. Now we're at the bench. <laughs> I am going to make this cut. I'm taking, um, I just gotta get that, la that little shoulder of material out of there. I could make this cut on the bench with a mallet and tap, 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 and then uh, this way, or you can use your chisel like a knife and just score right in there, across there with the corner, and then I can come in this way, holding it really short, so I'm not gonna lose control of it. It's not like I'm cutting toward my hand. And there, just releases beautifully. This is if you, in case you didn't get it all the way to the tenon. The other side, I scored the tenon, so I didn't have this issue, but this one. Okay, and then we'll, I'm just gonna hold it like this. I'm holding it short, you see, so my finger is a stop right there. So I've got a lot of control of this chisel. I wouldn't want to do this like this. See? <laughs> That's not a good thing. So when you hold it like this, it's just like a very controlled knife cut. All right, so there, we're all set. Now let's see how it fits. So this is the bottom left. Here's the one we just cut, the one. And hopefully this will fit. Oh, it's a little snug. I'm not. I'm trying to think where. But you know what? All I have to do is take a uh, large flat chisel, and there's there's tiny little ridges sometimes between these. So I'm going to come inside those and just skim. I'm just skimming this smooth right here. That's all it's gonna take. I don't know if you can see those little, tiny little ridges between the chisel, the hollow chisel. And I'm staying away from the exit wound there. I don't wanna take much off there because I don't wanna widen that up. I want it to be a look, good looking fit. So we'll come from this side. Tenon. 
this is a tenon. This is a through tenon. I'm not sure what a tenon through tenon is. Oh, that's what I did on the. If you mean a tenon going through another tenon, I did do that on the coffee table. Um, but um, I'm not doing that right now. If that's if I'm understanding you right. All right, so um, here's my, here, let's check it out now. It's going in a little better. You know, I got to make sure that I'm not binding actually on the top and bottom because, let's check it this way. Uh, fits pretty good that way, so fits just right. So it might be that I'm binding a little on the top and bottom. So I want to go in there. Maybe I got to open this up a touch. Just gonna come in with the chisel. I can see the knife line just there. Uh, this would be good to actually clamp. Could just be all that we're needing. One of those mortising cuts, I may have come just a touch shy. Looks like a tiny bit at the top. I think that's the one at the top here. That's really what I should have checked first because <laughs> that's one of the things that happens in classes a lot. Like I, when we're fitting mortises, uh, sometimes, you know, you if your first one, you're, you're just thinking, man, this is way too tight. And so you just keep, sh you know, I would show students, oh, just rasp lightly the tenon and fit it in the mortise. And so just keep rasping and rasping and then finally realize, oh shoot, it's actually binding on the top and bottom. And so once you cleared that up, after all that rasping, the thing just went bloop and <laughs> fell right in, which I may get right now, but no, it's actually pretty snug still. I'm binding on one of these tops or bottoms. So see how easy this is, how fast. Okay. There we go. Oh, were we getting some comments? Were you hearing my increased heart rate? <laughs> Um, with shoulders and without. Well, typically they, they almost always have shoulders. The, just recently, I was just reviewing my next article in Fine Woodworking Magazine. <laughs> no, I actually, today I was. Uh, I, me I mentioned this last time. There's one coming out on making that bed. That headboard fits in with no shoulders like it's a mortise kind of fitting right in. And that's one of the points they made in the article that I didn't even think to make um, was that in making a bed like that, that low pencil pose bed is what the article is going to be about. There's three different types of ways of cutting mortises and tenons on that bed. You know, you have the long rails that are stout. You have these smaller ones like this. And then you have the actual tenon for the headboard that has no shoulder. All right, hopefully this will fit. This is when you... Okay, yes, that was the problem. So, man, that, look, at, look at how sweet that is. All tight, so tight right around. And that's just hand pressure. And then we've, we've got it proud out the other end. We've got our eighth of an inch. And there you have it. So, um, you could chamfer this too which we I'll show you in a minute but let's go ahead and knock this other one out it'll be pretty fast hopefully <laughs> it'll fit easier than this one but that's a super fit I should mention too one of the things that I often do is make sure that the exit if you're really having trouble fitting a long one and you're not sure where it's binding whatever just make sure that first of all the this is the tenon that's coming through so it went through this way and exited here what i often do is make sure check this to see how it fits 
in the on the exit. This is going to be where it's going to be coming through and what you're going to see. That's the only part of the joint you're going to see. So you want to cut that and make sure that it fits nicely and then don't take anything else off of the tenon or that space. Then you know all your work has to be here and by the time you get to the exit you know once it comes through it's going to be a nice fit because you didn't take any more off once you got it there. I can actually see a little tiny jog in the what the hollow chisel mortiser did there and that might be what's making it just that little bit snug. There we are. Okay, so let's give it one more try. Ah, oh, that was it. Okay, so there we have it. Nice fit. That almost feels like it doesn't need glue. I mean, you could do that with a peg, but... All right, so now we're going to take this joint and we're going to assume you don't have a hollow chisel mortiser and you want to enjoy the, the fun the pure fun of drilling holes and then chiseling to there. So this is a little bit old school. I don't get to use this very often, but my mocking gauge, this is my old timey one, and it has the double pin on one side and the single knife edge on the other. You notice that quite often when we're cutting mortises here, whoops, we use the uh, marking gauge that has a knife in it and it's got a little beveled edge and it's beautiful. This is what we use to mark for all our dovetails and everything. It slices and it leaves a really crisp, beautiful line. However, when you buy this type, quite often, uh, this is from Crown Tools, this is a marking gauge and it comes with a double pin. And what's nice about these is you can score two lines at once, but these gauges, when they come, they're pins, they're round pins. They're like nails sticking through. So they don't slice, they drag, and they, they make a rough kind of dragging score line. So not ideal for marking dovetails, um, but notice how you can separate the pins and you adjust this for the mortise. So this is actually used for making marks for mortises. So with one like this, we would set those pins, stay right there, and just get them so that the points are resting right on our tenon. Whoops. And then you snug it up, you lock it in, that keeps it from moving. And that also you'd adjust the fence distance. Now notice my old one here. I got this, this is 30 something years old too. Got this in a flea market, gorgeous rosewood and brass infills, all nice brass, $15, but that was a few years ago, but I'm sure they're still around. But this has the double pin too, and Frank Klaus had a video back then that I love watching, and he talked about taking a little file and filing your pins so that they slice and they don't drag. And that's what I did on this a long time ago. And this little threaded screw rod here is what separates the pins. So what I did was I went ahead and I set those pins to exactly the width of our tenon. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I adjusted the fence so that it was equal to what we just did on the hollow chisel mortiser. See that? So now we're ready to make our marks down here. So we're, we, these are going to be our guidelines. We're going to just score using the face on the fence of the fence here, here. I'm just going to drag it. I'm getting some nice little cuts there. And I just want to see them clearly. There we are. Flip it in for end. Same thing over here. So if you don't have a hollow chisel mortiser and you want to try this, you'll need a, a marking gauge like this that has the double pin. Okay, once you're done, now we know we're going to take it over to the drill press. And this is a 5 16 slot we marked. So we're going to use a quarter inch bit, center it, so we'll just have like a 30 second to shear off each side. And those knife cuts are going to be our guidelines for fitting this beautiful mortise. All right, let's head on over. 
we're doing just one. If you were building a chair or a coffee table like that one, you would have to mark all these out. And it takes a little while. And then you'd have to rig it up and, and drill them all out. But it's the repetition where you get some economy um, and efficiency. But this is a significantly slower process because we're just drilling a round hole. We have to square it up ourselves. So here we go. We're going to go about halfway in from both sides. Okay, flip end for end. And it can feel it break through. All right, there we go. So let's go back to the bench, clean this up. I'm just gonna get some of those chips out of there so we can chop it without as much resistance. They get kind of jammed in there, but there we go. So check that out. You got a slot, but it's pretty messy. What a difference, huh? This is the first pass with the hollow chisel mortiser. This is our drill bit, but that's okay because we got our guidelines and we're ready to hit it. We're confident craftsmen and I'm going to just hold that on the bench. I'm going to throw a clamp on it and I'll get the one inch chisel. This is kind of good practice for shearing out. This is what you actually had to do on the headboard for that low post bed to fit the headboard tenons. So I'm just going to take a little bit off, not go quite to the knife line yet. The marking gauge knife line. And now I'm going to go to the, the line. I'm going to just put the, the chisel right in that knife line. That gives me the perfect place placement. And then I, I'm going to hold my shoulder right up over it and nicely and controlled. <laughs> Try not to go all the way through. Just shear off the sidewall and keeping it as plumb as I possibly can. It's not a lot of material, so, and you're cutting across the grain, so it's not a lot of resistance. You gotta, I'm kind of holding back with this hand here so I don't lose it. And I can easily move it and place it with that hand there too. There we go. Just rock it. Just, I'm holding it. I'm sighting this chisel so I can feel it's just as plumb, as vertical as I can possibly be. And I'm just going a little over halfway. I'm not trying to go the whole way here. Okay, once I've got that. You could use a mallet there too. It's fine. But now I'm going to use... The 16th inch, of, I'm sorry, 5 16 chisel, mortising chisel, and I'm going to do the end chops. I was a little shy of the end cut. Now I'm going to use it right in the knife line. 
and hold it vertically. I can even overcut this a little bit. It doesn't really hurt. And just go a little over halfway. Then I come back the other way. Come on, baby. Okay, now I'm gonna flip it over and repeat from the other side, if you can get your chisel out. <laughs> I'm going to now clamp it down and we'll get the same process going from this side. So now I'm going to set the chisel into the knife line. You can't, this one's a little blind. The other side I think you'll see. Again, just go, you know, if you can get really accurate at this, you don't have much cleanup to do. You come from the other side, but... Now this is a different technique than using a mortising chisel. If you use a mortising chisel, you never go this way. Your everything is this way. So you just keep chop, 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 because the width of the mortising chisel defines the whole cut. So it's all these cut chops across end grain and digging deeper, and you just kind of go with a series of motions across. And when you get down there, you're holding it as plumb as you possibly can the whole time. That's why it has this flat handle. So it gives you a better orientation to true. But, and that's why it's so beefy, because it's making all those end chops. However, this method, you just need to shear these sidewalls so you're using a wider chisel and you're using the knife line in a different way. Okay, so now I'm right in that knife line. Okay, I feel it ease up. I'm meeting the other side. Again. Do you have a, a no, no, what your mortise chisel uh, make, who made your mortise chisel? Um, I'll look in a second. I think the name's on there. Marples. It's an old Marples. I got this right after I moved. I moved, we moved up here <laughs> from, uh, that was in 98. So those, I know that because that was the first class I ever taught at the Shaker Village. And I uh, had everybody hand chopped all the mortises for a little end table. What a, what an adventure that was. I had to build a whole table in one day. What was I thinking? But we did it. And it was four women actually at the first class. So you can imagine how much fun that was. I mean, we were not not because they were women, but they nobody had any experience. Nobody had any idea what they're getting into. And I was one of them. I didn't realize how long it would take. But all right, I'm gonna go right there for a second so I can set this. Get the bottom and then we're going to be able to test it. It's not really all the way, but I'll just eyeball it there. Okay, beautiful. All right, so now let's take it off and see once if we clean it up, if we can get a good fit. Let me get some of those shavings out of there. A lot of effort. That's basically what's being said on here. It's rigor. A lot of rigor mortis. You want to talk a little about using a plunge router to do this? Um, I did earlier. Like oh, that's, okay. an, that's a method you can also use. Um, it's, you, it's just a method where you have to set up some kind of controlling fence so you can plunge and then move across. In some projects I have used a plunge router um, and I think uh, the Adirondack chair project, I used a plunge router using the guide collars in a pretty creative way, um, in a way to use some, make some floating tenons. However, this, this is also a good experience because if you 
you get some practice with this, but you also grow to really appreciate your hollow chisel mortiser. <laughs> you're like, what was I thinking? So Tom, is a mortising chisel necessary or can you use a 5 16 You can use a regular, chisel? yeah. You don't need a mortising chisel. I just wanted to talk about that as um, the original method of doing this. I mean, just imagine almost all mortises were cut that way, you know, but then, you know, with posts and beams, they had these gadgets that actually drilled holes and then they would, they would do this with large slicks and, and actually in large chisels and cut those mortises, just chop them. Of course, that was less finicky, um, but you could do it in a big way. Be outside with all your buds, having a good time, and then you raise the building. What a time that would be. All right, I still got a little debris in there, but um, let me just trim some of the light pieces out. Let's see if we can get this to fit. This is it, this is the two going into the mortise, let's see. Oh, it's not too bad actually. I can feel it's binding at the top. I've got to just lighten it up just a touch. So this is why, <laughs> this is why I have all chisel mortiser. But I wanted you to see, in case you didn't have it. Now, if you were doing this all the time, your proficiency with making these work ramps up. You know, it's not as hard after the first one. Let's see if I can get this in. There it is. Look at it. Just as tight all the way around. A little blood to show. And look at that. Nice exit. It's a beautiful mortise. So let's compare it to the one at the top. Oh, by the way, before I put that in, if you want, you know, you would, before you glue, before you glue it up, it's always a good idea to do the chamfering so that, you know, you'd clean up the end of this tenon nice. So I even sand it before I glue up so that it's kind of burnished. See, you give it that sweet little 45 there, about a sixteenth of an inch, something like that. Then you could take a block, burnish it a little bit with Sam. We won't do that part, but just so you can see, once it goes through, then you have a finished end when it's glued up versus a hard edge. So now the advanced way of doing this also is to put a couple wedges in there. We're not going to do that, but I just want to show you what the internal, what it looks like internally. So here's one, same kind of setup, but I made a couple saw cuts on the band saw, about a quarter inch in from the end, so that you have a springiness to this. And then you have, I drill a hole at the bottom so they don't split, the, the spring remains, that little, that's a little trick that makes a difference. And then the mortise is cut the same, but where it's exiting, you chop a little bit of a taper so that those can flare and you'll get that, you'll get that wedged in there beautifully. So let me check, there we go. So that goes through and then you'd clamp that up to whatever piece it was. And now see that little gap there? In goes the wedge, the wedge. And you tap these on both sides. See it's springing out? Now it's springing out. So of course you'd have glue in here and when those are driven all the way and that slams up and it's glued, it's a mechanical fit. I mean, it's total overkill, but think of the glue itself would be enough, but that just slams it really tight. And you end up after finish with a joint that looks like that. Isn't that sweet? So you can use a contrasting color for your wedge. I'm using the white oak here. This is cherry. You could use something darker with a lighter wood and sets it off, makes it kind of nice. All right, so there you have it. A quick crash course in a couple different ways of doing through tenons. Here's the one I did earlier. Let's put the whole thing together. 
and have a totally, not oh. useless, but a totally <laughs> functionless project except for the visual. Look at that. We've, now look at, this would be, this is the beginning of a beautiful post and beam structure <laughs> for a cat or it's something like that. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thanks again for being here. If you want to get go deeper or see more about what we're doing, head on over to epicwoodworking.com. Um, we've got some amazing, awesome announcements coming up about opportunities you can have for live courses and being connected with us even more. And also, you can check out the courses and videos we have in there. But most importantly, you want to be on our mailing list. We do give insider advances to the mailing list people. And we don't bug you or anything like that. If you enjoy this content, consider subscribing and liking and sharing. On behalf of the Camerlane and I, thanks for coming by. We'll look forward to seeing you next time right back here.